content. We spoke about authenticity of the Bible, of course. We spoke about God and science, and we spoke about God and suffering. All three really important issues that a lot of my friends like come to me and ask me, like, so what's going on with that? Remember how we had uh, the blackboard in the cafe a couple of weeks ago? And uh, we were actually asking you, what are the questions of your friends? And uh, we haven't uh, covered all of them yet. So today, we're going to cover heaps of them. I got this card full of your questions and the questions that I actually get all the time from my friends, my neighbors, uh, who else, uh, my, uh, my colleagues, and, and I think you as well. Uh, so, so today will be mostly about God, about religion, and we'll be answering questions like, what is truth? Um, maybe something like, but I'm a good person, why do we need Jesus? Or, um, what else do we have? Oh yeah, like, are Christians not hypocrites? Like, really interesting, interesting questions. So we have an amazing panel today. So shall we give them a big hand and invite them up on stage, which is Judith, Louis, and Steve. Please come up, give them a big hand. You guys can sit down. That's lovely. That's great. Uh, first of all, we have, uh, we have Judith there taking the microphone. She's actually one of the staff here, and she has a master's in theology. So she knows lots about the Bible. Uh, then we also have Louis Bittin. Uh, he, uh, he's one of our pastors, and uh, he studied a uh, master's in uh, business analytics and financial mathematics, which, which I think is awesome. He works at IBM at the moment. And, uh, and he's a smart guy. Then we have, uh, then we have our amazing pastor, Steve Warren. So that's cool. Uh, I'm really excited for, uh, for what you guys will share. He has no qualifications. No qualifications <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> Never done a master's. Uh, actually, like, what do you call it in English? What's in English? Physics, that's right, physics. You still don't know what it is. No, I'm kidding. You all know what that is. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really excited. Let's, let's be open today. Yeah. Maybe uh, our past experiences or um, uh, some emotion, things that happen in our life, stop us from being open. But let's try to be open today to actually give, give you know, objectively look at what can be truth. And uh, I have great questions. I'm going to just start. Yeah. I'm, I'm just excited. I'm going to sit down. <coughs> let's go. Look, this is official. Right, that's great. All right, first question. Happens to me all the time. I have lots of neighbors and I talk to my neighbors, it's great. And they used to tell me, Sipka, I am not really religious. So, oh yeah. yeah. I want to Steve, dive in on there this one. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I think if you're Dutch, um, your, your neighbor may say, uh, but I don't believe. So they'll either say, I don't believe or uh, I'm not religious. And if, if I'm really honest, um, I don't blame them for saying that because maybe church has given the impression that we are religious, that we are a religious organization. We have, uh, we have institutionalized our faith. Uh, in fact, what seems to prove that is 43% of the Netherlands say they're Christian, um, but only 18% of Dutch people go to church. And even then, that would be an exaggerated percentage, I think, if you were to say, how many of you go to church regularly? Uh, and so therefore, there's a big gap that tells us that there perhaps are more people than we think who have a respect for uh, God, uh, but would not want anything to do with institutionalized belief of some sort. Uh, and that's why we're talking about this. I think it's just a really important topic to try and help people separate Jesus from what they categorize as religion. Yeah, totally. But then, then I'm just thinking about the Netherlands. So not many people uh, go to church, are religious, are Christians. But still, I think our country is doing pretty well. By the way, I'm actually going to ask some questions like, like I am an unbeliever. Don't think I'm there. Yeah. But still, I'm gonna, I'm gonna act a little. You're getting worried, hey? A youth pastor's just like, what do you think? Um, so that our country's still going pretty well, although, uh, mo like many people, are not necessarily Christians. So why would we need God then in our country? Any any take it? Yeah, you did it. I'll take it. It's a good question. I think um, fundamentally, we know a lot of people in our world who do great good. Um, they're not Christians. They don't believe in God. 
But I think fundamentally the question is, can goodness even exist um, without God? And I think when we answer that question, we have to say no. Um, and the reason is because um, we don't have an objective moral reference point. And you guys are probably going, what on earth is that? So this is why the introduction that Steve has is really important, because you actually have a physics degree. And so he actually knows a little bit about this. See, for me, high school was like ages ago. But what, what is a reference point? Can you Steve just explain to us? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but he, you know, he studied it. He should know. He should I remember it for the physics. rest of his life. You know? I studied physics 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> so a reference point is a fixed point which you compare other things to to make those other things real. So I'll give an example. Um, how do we know movement is real if this pen is moving? If this whole building was moving, and we were all moving with it, and this pen was moving, you could not say this pen was moving. You wouldn't know that it was moving. It, we only know it's moving because if I'm the reference point, the fixed point, you see the pen is here, and now it's here, compared to the fixed point, me. So now you can say, it's moving. Same with volume, it's louder or quieter. That makes no sense unless you've defined the fixed point somewhere of noise is. Uh, and then new things can be quieter, louder, slower, faster, etc. Yeah, exactly. So well, well, what I was, oh good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what that actually means in context of uh, morality and of God is that um, we see God as that reference point. So God is the objective moral reference point that we hinge everything that um, we do on. Um, and if so, if God doesn't exist, then we don't have that moral objective reference points. And what that means is that actually we end up having subjective morality. And if we have subjective morality, it's like, I know Sipka plans out his meals all week. Oh, yeah. So, so whenever you, the youth guys probably know what, you have to pick which day you come to Sipka's house, right? So you know what you're having and if you like the food or not. But Louis he likes to cook on the go. That's, that's subjective. It's a subjective thing. Um, and so if... If everything is subjective, then we can't actually say that good... So, so in an atheistic world, there is no God. So there is no objective moral reference point, which means we can't really say anything about good or bad. Because if you guys have a cat, I don't know if you guys have a cat or a dog, or if your cat eats a mouse, um, then you probably wouldn't judge it for it. You'd probably say, oh, it's just being a cat. Well, that's exactly the same thing, because... Um, <coughs> We are highly, according to atheism, we're highly evolutionized animals, you know? We, so we are just accidents of nature. So we can't really then say, okay, there is a good and there's a bad and judge people on certain behaviors. But the problem with that is objective good and bad do exist. So, so if I take these. No, don't take them. <laughs> Sivka's like, don't take these. You know, that's not fair. These are my notes. Good notes, by the way. Thanks. These are my notes. I need them. You know, we all, when injustice happens around us, when we see racism or discrimination or um, child abuse, we all go, that's not fair. That's an injustice. And that is an internal uh, moral compass that God has placed inside of us. You know, God is that moral compass. God is good. Um, God's character is good, and that's the objective reference point. So if we have no God, then... So, so what you're saying is um, that there's no good or bad unless God exists. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. I have, I have a, there's, a, there's a quote, um, which is really cool, actually, of Michael Roos. He's an atheist. He says, the man that says it's morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man that says two plus two is five. So it's... it's it's objective. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just add that the, um, if goodness is subjective, if, if we were to say, that's, that's good for you, but not for me, okay, so that would be subjective. That's your goodness, this is my goodness. Then um, terrorism would be okay. Because they are genuinely doing it because they think it's right. Therefore, that's okay in that worldview. We can't but, judge it. We cannot judge it, we should not judge it, but we should because <laughs> nearly everybody knows somehow deep within them that that is not right. So I think that's what he's saying, it's that we have this moral guide inside of us that typically knows basically what is right and wrong and what 
is good and bad. Yeah. It's an objective measure. Yeah. And the Bible says God's put that nature on our hearts. Yeah. Yeah. And we would all agree on that, like always. It's, it's not like it's, it's yeah. one situation, you know, it's not like in this situation it's, it's like that and that's, no, we all agree those things are wrong or right, always, for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, so, well then, my friends would probably say something like this. Uh, well, that's true for you, but it's not necessarily true for you, for me. And maybe, Louis, this one's for you, we haven't heard you yet. And then, and then they always, like, smile a little bit uncomfortably, they're like, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and they say something like, well, we can all choose ourselves what we believe, right? Um, Louis, what should I say in a situation like that? I think, I, I think there are sort of, um, uh, the, the last sentence that you that you mentioned, uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, everyone can decide what they want to believe. Uh, like we, we, there, there should be no compulsion uh, to, to make people believe certain things, or uh, everyone should be free to choose what they believe. Uh, I, I agree with that. Um, but the first statement that, 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 you, that you said, that everyone can decide what is true for themselves, uh, that makes truth relative. Um, and, and that's a whole different step. Uh, th that's a whole different uh, uh, thing. So, so I think we've all heard someone say this, but maybe a colleague or a friend that has ever said to you, well, that's true for you, and you know, you know that's fine. This is true for me. Um, but that, uh, that's actually uh, making truth relative. Um, in, in, in classical logic, uh, there's a, a law that is referred to uh, as the law of non-contradiction. Which basically means that two statements uh, that contradict each other, that are opposite, that can't both be true. Um, and then a simple example would be this. I have a pen. Um, this is the, the pen analogy uh, panel. <laughs> Where's my pen analogy? I don't know. Why didn't you bring it? <laughs> but uh, let's say that I would say that this pen is blue and then Sipka would say that this pen is red. Like you can all see that. Uh, uh, for convenience sake, uh, I'm choosing myself to be true, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, we can see that we can't both be right on this matter. Like, this pen is objectively blue, um, and we agree on that. We, we wouldn't discuss uh, or, or question this matter. That's a, an observable fact. Um, but for some reason, when we, you know, when we take that, we take that principle and we apply it to small things, like we would all agree this is a table, this is a white table. None of us would argue with that. None of us would say, oh, you believe it's a white table, it's fine. I believe it's a brown table. No, that, that, that's weird to, to say that. But somehow, that same logic uh, should apply to beliefs as well. Uh, and, and for some reason, we don't apply it to beliefs because we, I don't, I don't think we, we like to argue with each other and say, no, I think you're wrong and, and I'm right. Um, when it comes to these big ideas. Um, but if you believe something that is contradicting what I believe, we can't both be right. Like, one of us is wrong, yeah. one of us is right, or we're both wrong, but we can't be uh, both right. Um, which I, th yeah. I think we should just, you know, live with. Yeah. And we should just accept the fact that maybe not everything we believe is correct and be challenged a little bit by the people around us. Yeah. Nice. It's a bit, yeah, a bit of a tougher answer, quite like. Then, then I'm going to ask a tough question as well. Because if not all religions can be correct or right or true at the same time, then why is Christianity true? I'll give that one to you, Steve. Uh, well, 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 it's a good question, a good uh, question. You know, it's one that we cannot convince anyone on, but uh, <coughs> just going back to what Louis said, the pe people who think truth is relative are usually not religious people. So, obviously in Christianity we know that uh, the claims about Jesus are different to how uh, Islam would claim about Jesus. And Islam would also be deeply committed to what they believe about God. They don't believe that the Christian God is the same, etc. Um, and so it's okay, is what I'm saying. It's okay to be convinced that what you believe is right. But make sure you've done your research to know what is right. Uh, that's the point we're trying to make. And so why is Christianity right? Well, Christianity is, is right for a couple of reasons. Firstly, uh, three weeks ago we looked at the topic of authenticity of the Bible. 
and, and we showed that the Bible is the most accurate ancient historic document. So therefore we know that the contents of the Bible are indisputable by historians. Therefore it only leaves the discussion over, over the nature of those contents. Do we want to make those contents real for us? Now, just to make it simple, the narrative of the Bible is something like this. Uh, we were made in the image of God. Uh, we deeply know that we are in need. Uh, every human being generally knows that they are less than what they could be or should be, that our hearts are broken in some way, our lives are broken in some way. Uh, and the message of the Bible is only Jesus Christ can do something about that, can repair that and repair the original intended relationship we need with God and, and therefore give us eternity. If that's the message, if that's also the claim of Jesus, if Jesus said, I am God, I am the only way to the Father, uh, then it leaves only a few options open to us. One option cannot be that he didn't say it because it's proven he said it. So the other options would be that he was lying uh, or he was mad, went around saying crazy, stupid things, or that it's actually true. Uh, and in fact, C.S. Lewis, um, the atheist turned Christian philosopher, uh, made a statement about this. Uh, his statement's fairly long, it'll come on the screen, but. Uh, if you want to read it, but he basically, in summary, is saying either Jesus was a liar, or he was a lunatic, or he was Lord. Now, there may be a few other little sub-options there, but it comes under those major categories. In fact, you could either say he's basically a, a madman liar, or he who is who he said he was. There's really only two basic options that we can choose by. Uh, and that's okay to have those options to choose by. So what, what might be good for us to do in the next few minutes is logically break that down. Why do we think that he might be true? That's why we've got a logical mathematician here. Oh, yeah. And uh, a logical theologian here because they're going to help me break this down for us. That'd be great. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. So good, we can watch him. And not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, don't fall asleep, Sipkin. So, Louis, <laughs> maybe you can go first. Tell us what you think the logical reasoning you would use to deduce that answer. Yeah, I think uh, maybe we can keep the quote on, on the screen because I think um, the, the logic sort of flows through that. Maybe you've heard people say that they, uh, friends or family say that they don't believe uh, Jesus is God, but he was a wise man who had a main, major influence on history on us, on our society, but they don't believe he was God. Um, and I think what C.S. Lewis is saying here is that that is one thing you cannot say. Um, uh, Jesus said about himself a couple of things. Uh, so either it's true what he said, uh, or he's a liar, or he's just mad, because that's what you qualify a guy who claims to be God, right? Like if someone would now claim to be God and you know him, you would think they were mad. Yeah. You would not take them seriously. Yeah. You, you wouldn't say of them, like, you're a wise, moral person. That's the one thing you would probably not say about that person. Oh, that's good. Right? So, yeah. um, so in classical logic, um, um, uh, there's a, another law that's called the, the law of, of the excluded middle. So you, you, you take a statement, and there's two options. Either it's true or it's false. Um, there's no middle road. So if Jesus says, I'm God, He's either uh, wrong, like he, he's saying the truth, or he's lying about it. Um, and the one thing you, uh, yeah, so it's either true or it's, or it's false. Um, and if it's true, then you're like, okay, that means he's God. Uh, and if it's false, that means he's either lying or he's mad. Uh, it doesn't leave the option of Jesus being a good moral teacher that a lot of people make him out to be. Um, and I think if you, if you reason a little bit further, we would all understand this, right? Like a good moral teacher uh, would not claim to be God. Uh, a good moral teacher would not you know, claim to be able to forgive sin. He would not say, I'm the way to salvation. Uh, he, he would not allow people to worship him. Um, it's, it's far from morally correct to, to claim that you are God, uh, unless you're God. I think, I think we have that, we all have that same feeling that that's wrong. It would be wrong for me to claim. Uh, to be gone because I'm not. 
Um, just so, you know, <laughs> just so that's out there. <laughs> um, and, and then I think the most obvious point is that um, a good moral teacher would not and could not die and, and rise again. And I think uh, uh, there is historical support and evidence for that. Uh, so with all of that said, we can't take Jesus and equate him to Buddha or Gandhi or Muhammad or other like, influential uh, people from history. That's just the one thing we can't do. So he's either God or he's a, a liar uh, or a madman. And, uh, and I think that's the, the fact that we have, we have to choose. We can't come up with other options. That's so logical there. I wish I could say that. <laughs> you know, tell us your my, theological perspective. My theological perspective. So I think I, I completely agree with Louis, and I think what's very important to realize is um, what the what the day and age that Jesus was living in. So if someone claims to be God now, um, we probably think they're nuts or you know not telling the truth. But now nowadays we have a pantheistic view of God. A lot of people say God is in everything. God is everything. Um, it's one of the biggest views out there. Back in the day, it was polytheistic. So the idea was there was lots of gods. So the Roman Empire was God, and that was perfectly fine. There was probably like 10 gods, and that was, that was fine. But the difference is um, that Jesus lived in the Jewish culture. And so the Jews had a monotheistic view of God, which means there was only one God, and it was the God who made the heavens and the earth. So to actually claim to be God in that setting, that cultural setting, was madness because um, it also had, um, was punishable by death as well. So basically you would have to be mad or you would have to be God, which, which I agree with. And um, obviously there's a lot of people who claim to be something that they're not. You know, we, we, know, we might even know them. I don't know. They might say they're Napoleon or I don't know, the Pope, but they're not. So it doesn't necessarily, this doesn't necessarily mean that um, Jesus is God, uh, but then we have to look at the fact, okay, but was he a madman then? And I think if I look at that logically, um, and I look at the things, if we look at, if we look through history, if you just do a, a search and, and start looking at everything, uh, Jesus in history and Jesus now, and the impact that he's had on this society and on the world is huge. Um, the things he said, you know, we, we travel faster. I was in an airplane last week. We, uh, we have a huge number of, of advances that we've done as humans, but actually the moral law and the teaching of Jesus, we have never improved upon ever in those 2,000 years, yeah. which says something about the level of uh, what it is. And to me, that doesn't sound like a bad, uh, <laughs> bad man. It doesn't sound like a bad man to me. A mad man could not have that much influence. Um, Time Magazine actually said, Jesus, the most persistent symbol of purity, selflessness, and love in the history of the Western man. Now that, to me, does not sound like a bad wow. man. So then, so then we come to the conclusion, do you guys watch Sherlock Holmes? Do you know who Sherlock Holmes is? All right, so Sherlock basically says, it's not this, it's not this, it's not that, so it must be that. And basically that, that's what I think. If we, we eliminate all the rest, then, Jesus is who he says he is. He's gone. Solid. These guys are so solid. Wow. That's great, that's great. But, there's a but. There's a but. I think there's still three things that I want to cover. Uh, things that I hear all the time, and I think you as well. Um, and I do think I hear like a really clear line about Jesus and about uh, a bit of transformation in there as well. But, so I'm really um, curious to, to what you guys would say on these three things. Um, so, first of all, uh, Christianity, um, or that's what people say, there's so much violence if we look at the history of Christianity, uh, so many religious wars, so why would Christianity or God be a good thing? That's what I hear a lot. The second thing is, but I don't hurt anyone. I live quite a good life, and um, why, why, why do I need God for that? I can, I can just do some good things around the place. And then the third thing is, are Christians not like a little bit hypocrite? Ooh, that's that's uh, You know, they go to the church on Sunday, everything's fine, and then on Thursday night. Anyway, um, so, so these three things, like anyone, like pick and go, I guess. Yeah, yeah Louis, go for it. I'll, I'll take the first one, because I, I struggled with this a little bit as well when, uh, when, I, when, I, came, when I came to Christ. 
Um, and I think I think we have to admit, like the, the church or Christian history, we're not guilt free. Um, there's a lot of bad stuff that happened, and things we would, you know, not definitely not agree with. Um, I do think there's a difference between you know historical facts and perception. If you, if you would look now and, and ask a random person what what had happened in the Middle Ages uh, with Crusades and the Inquisition later on and you know, witch hunts and, and a lot of bad things that the church did and I think most people would tend to think that this would cost the lives of millions of people and historical evidence shows that it cost the life in, in a period of 500 years around 250,000 people which is still significant if you take into account population sizes in that day um, so the conclusion that a lot of people take from, from that and what happened in the church is that um, we must get rid of religion because all wars stem from religion, so if we get rid of religion, if we get rid of Christianity, other religions, then we would live in a war-free world. And I, th I think that's just uh, taking it uh, a couple of steps too far, um, because you only have to look back at the last century, which was by far the bloodiest century that we ever had. Um, and there are a couple of non-religious uh, leaders and, and, and nations and like, uh, systems, political systems, that killed millions of people. Uh, if you look to Nazi Germany, uh, Hitler was non-religious. He would he claimed to be an atheist, uh, and that's the way he he he, he, he led his country. Uh, so uh, at least six million people died um, uh, from his direct actions uh, by Nazi Germany. Uh, the same for Khmer Rouge, which was a Cambodian uh, stream of uh, Cambodian stream of, of uh, communism. They killed two million people in their own country. Uh, non-religious. Uh, leadership uh, and Stalin uh, is, was definitely an atheist and he killed 20 million of his own people um, because they did not agree with his views um, and, and, and Mao which is probably the biggest example in, in, in China, communist China, killed between 50 and 70 million people um, uh, because they opposed his views which is crazy right so I, I think that the, the conclusion that we'd, we'd get rid of wars if you would get rid of religion is just uh, false. It's not right. Um, uh, and I, I, think, I think also what, what is really important is that the reason in Christianity, in our belief that we don't look to the church for answers, but we look to Christ, is simply this, uh, is that uh, often church's history or Christian history uh, differs from the teaching of Christ. And, and if we want to you know, say whether a, a system is good or, or bad, we have to look at the fundamental teachings of Christ, and, and He taught love, He taught peace, He taught forgiveness. Um, so I think that's what we need to come to. Uh, I think that also hinges um, well into your second question. You know, I'm a yeah. good person, yeah. so why do I have to um, come a Christian? I think there's an assumption in that question um, where we say that there is a good person. So I'm reminded of the, the story in the Bible. Um, I think it's in uh, Luke where a guy comes to Jesus and he says, hey, good teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Um, and then Jesus says, why did you call me good? And then he answers his own question. He says, no one is good but God. And so what he's actually saying is that, you know, as we already discussed before, God is good. And so we can never measure up to that goodness of God. We can try and be as good as, as we want, but ultimately, we have to, the cross reminds us that um, we can never attain to that and uh, that we have to be saved from ourselves. Um, and sometimes we mistake Christianity uh, in the sense that we think it's all about living a good life, um, but really we're broken people trying to um, go in the footsteps of a perfect God and, and we're going to stumble, we're going to trip, we're going to fall. You know, I'm not perfect. You guys. We're not perfect. <laughs> Sorry to break it too. But we all make mistakes. Um, we all uh, stumble. And, um, you know, where, where I might see failure, God actually sees growth. And where I might see, you know, addiction, He sees the next step. And where I say, okay, I, I, you know, I can't see it anymore, He says, you can do it. Yeah. I'm giving you perspective, I'm giving you vision. Um, and ultimately, Jesus did not come to earth to, um, to show us how to get good luck. Sure, he did that, but ultimately he came down to die on the cross for us and to give us freedom, 
to give us forgiveness of our sins, to uh, set us free, to heal us, and to give us that opportunity for transformation. Um, because we need that grace. And ultimately, that's, um, so it's not about living a good life. Wow. Yeah. That's well, that's great. Yeah, it's not about a measure of goodness. Christianity is not about being good. Um, hypocrisy, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a third one. Yeah, Christians are hypocrites. <laughs> um, well, the word hypocrite means actor. Um, so, in that respect, I think I think we're all pretty good at that. Uh, I think we're all pretty good at putting on a face. Uh, I'm not sure that's really specifically about Christians. I think human beings generally, we're all just really good at putting on masks and covering our true self. And sometimes we have to, sometimes it's a protection. But sometimes it's not necessary. Um, but it is what it is. And, uh, but I think probably the thing that disturbs us more is when, uh, when people say one thing and they do another thing. Uh, but again, I see that all the time around me. I'll meet you at 12 o'clock and they turn up at 12.30. Um, they say one thing and do another thing. Uh, and I can't say that that's been limited to Christianity. Uh, what, is, what is probably the most truthful thing for me to say is, therefore, is you're absolutely right. Christians are hypocrites, as we all are. Because we're all imperfect, broken people, of pretty much what you just said. Uh, we, we are not perfect, we're not, it's not like once you begin to trust Jesus suddenly all your problems disappear. Yeah. I, uh, I really, the, I significantly got changed by Jesus Christ when I was 19 years old. That's when I began to fully trust him with my life. And uh, if someone was to say to me when they saw me at 21 years old, my gosh, Steve is a hypocrite. Uh, he says one thing and does another. They would be right. They, they would be right to say that he believes all this stuff, all these things Jesus says, and yet he lives like this. However, if someone saw me when I was 30, I'd like to think they would say, he's still a hypocrite, but not as much as he used to be. <laughs> he, he says all this stuff, but you know he's getting some of it right. And then by the time I was 40, of course, Life begins at 40, therefore I reached the age of perfection. Wow. People, uh, people would have been saying, you know, okay, he's not perfect, but there's integrity in what he is, how he's living. And so we shouldn't see Christianity as a, like an overnight perfection machine. Yeah. Uh, it's a life of transformation. That, we begin trusting Jesus and we continue to trust him. Yes, we're imperfect, but that's the point. That's the point. We are broken and kind, humankind is broken. Therefore, we need a savior and he's gonna keep working on us. He's gonna keep us uh, in a place where we keep reforming to what he wants us to do. That's so good, that's so transparent. Shall we give this amazing panel like a huge Thanks so much. Thanks for opening us. I learned actually a lot, that's great. Um, let's watch the screen, do a little video, and then Pastor Steve will close the video. Cheers.